All right, so I was uh, reading through the Bible a little while ago, and I came across the book of Ruth, and it just really stood out to me. It's just an interesting and great story. Um, so tonight I'm going to be preaching from the book of Ruth, um, and the title of the sermon is called Ruth the Moabitess. Um, so there's a few things we're going to, I'm going to cover from this story, but so turn to the book of Ruth. We're going to be there for most of the night, but we will be going other places as well. So we'll start in chapter 1, at verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of the wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Marlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took from them wives, they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Marlon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So we see here we got three widows. One was Naomi, who was the elder, and she had two daughters in law who were also widowed by her sons. The younger widows were encouraged to remarry so they could be taken care of as the famine you know, continued. Um, and in this case, Naomi instructs, instructs them to return to the home of their fathers and mothers um, so that they can be taken care of and find new husbands. And this is what you should do as well. If your husband dies or anything happens to them, you should go back to your parents and, and be under the roof of your father because you should always, you know, the women should always be under the rule of either their husband or their father. Um, we'll continue in, uh, in verse 6. It says, Then she arose with the daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab now that the Lord has vis- had visited his people in giving them bread. And we see here that God visits his people. You know, I think David said that he's never seen a righteous man begging bread. You know, and they're actually, they're actually people, as we'll see with Boaz, who was wealthy during the time of famine in the nation of Israel. It says, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return into the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. So these people, you know, these two women had a great relationship with their mother-in-law. You know, they'd, obviously they'd lost their father-in-law, they'd lost two husbands, but they were still very close, and they didn't want to leave. Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, If I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes, that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. So we see that Naomi is an older widow. She believes she's not able to have any further children, and she doesn't want these younger women to hang around so she can actually produce more children. She could have sons that they could marry. You know, even if it were possible for her, and we don't know if it was or not, but she certainly felt like it wasn't. Um, it's important to, th- to understand what the Lord thinks about widows and how they should be treated. So we'll turn to First Timothy chapter 5. We actually have very good instruction here in the book of Timothy to do with widows. And Pastor Kevin covered this a little while ago. It was a few weeks ago, I think. Uh, but we'll just go through it again, starting in verse 1. It says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. The elder woman, the older women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for it is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. 
But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge so that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, especially for they of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. Well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that I may relieve them that are widows indeed. So here in verse 4, we see that, you know, first the children should take care of the widowed parents, you know, the widowed mother. It's the children's responsibility and the nephews to take charge there, but also in verse 16, that the younger widows are to marry, um, but while they're seeking a husband, they're not to be busybodies or to return unto Satan, and I think that means that, you know, to either return to the world, to, to give up the faith and go whoring or into fornication or even to marry somebody else, you know, to, to just give up the faith. Um, and if they're, if they're not doing that, but rather they're staying in the church, these young women, and they're serving the house of the Lord, you know, then it's the men of faith that are to take care of them, to make sure that they are taken care of while they seek a husband. And the widows indeed who are too old to have a husband, which it says 60 years or older, the ones who have served faithfully in the church, um, they have no children to take care of them, then the church steps in and takes care of them. Um, I'll just read to you from Exodus chapter 22. It says, Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Leviticus 22 verse 13, it says, But if the priest's daughter be a widow or divorced and have no child and is returned unto her father's house as in her youth, she shall eat of her father's meat, but there shall no stranger eat thereof. So again, we see there that even with the priest's daughters, if, they, if their husband died, they were a widow, they were to return to their father's house. Um, and Deuteronomy chapter 10 it says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty, and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. So again, we see the provision here of God for the fatherless, the widow, the stranger, and the poor. So we'll turn to Psalm 146. It's a short psalm, we'll read this one. It says in verse 1, Praise ye the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to the earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is the Lord his God which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners that are, that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous, sorry, looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and the widow. By the way of the wicked he turneth, Upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise you, the Lord. Now, I mean, this is just an amazing psalm in itself. Like, you could preach entire sermons out of this. Um, but, you know, it talk speaks about how this is the God that, you know, blessed are they that have the God of Jacob to be their God. The one who, who gives food to the hungry and who, you know, opens the eyes of the blind, which we would say is through salvation. You know, he opens the, the eyes of the blind 
Um, you know, he loveth the righteous. He also, you know, takes care of the fatherless and widows. And this is the provision that he has for them. He has it for us as well, but especially for them. We see that, you know, the provisions in Timothy as well, as the men of faith to faithfully provide. Um, so we'll go back to Ruth chapter 1. But I just love how it doesn't matter what state we're in, God will always provide for us. So we'll pick up in verse 14. It says, And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed their mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people, and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. I mean, now wouldn't you want this relationship with your daughter, whether it's your blood daughter or a daughter-in-law? Like, wouldn't you want them to love you so much that they're like, wherever you die, I'm going to die there too. I'm going to be with you and your people. So we see here also, Orpah chose to return home to her father's house. But Ruth did make that important decision. And I like this in verse 15. It says, her sister-in-law returned unto her people and to her gods. This is the gods of the Moabites. And Ruth chose rather the God of Israel as her God and the people of God as her people. So I'll pick up in verse 18. So when she saw she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, Call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. So we saw in verse 13, now Naomi was bitter, She's saying the Lord was against her, and she changed her name to Mara to reflect that. You know, she just lost her sons and, and her husband, so I can understand, you know, and empathize why she'd be bitter. Um, but we need to also be careful not to lay a charge on the Lord, you know, to accuse him of, of why, you know, of afflicting you, of why you're in bitterness, you know. So just that's something to be careful of, because I know we can all fall into that trap as well. Um, so we'll go on to chapter 2 as the story keeps going. It says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn, after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. So this is another point we saw in, you know, we, we saw earlier that uh, in Timothy you've got the children or the nephews or you've got the men of faith or the church who can take care of the uh, the widows but another way is also through them gleaning for their own food so we're going to look at that as well um, so turn to Deuteronomy chapter 24 and you know I mean it'd be nice if we had these laws today but of course you know government doesn't allow us to own any land and to actually till it ourselves you know so but in the Old Testament, God's provision was perfect. He had ways for everybody to be able to survive, to succeed, if they were in the Lord by his perfect law. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 24. We'll start in verse 12. It says, And if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. If any, in any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his own raiment, and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. If, uh, thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of in thy brethren or of the strangers that are in thy land within the gates. At this day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor and setteth his heart upon it. 
lest he cry against, against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto, unto thee. The father shall not put, be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. But thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee thence. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And when thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. So again, we see God's provision here is if you're harvesting your crops, to always leave something behind so that people can come in afterwards and pick up what they need so they can survive. I mean, this is just a perfect way to, to live. And again, it'd be great if we could do this, but you know, we don't even live in a, a farming economy really anymore. Um, I'll read to you from Leviticus 19. Verse 9, it says, And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest, and thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard, thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. And when you reap the, sorry, Leviticus 23, And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of the, thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So these are even commandments of God. It's not just good practice, but actually God commanded them to do this because when they were in Egypt in captivity, he provided for them there. And he's saying that I want to provide for these people as well. And this is how we're going to do it. And we even see in Luke chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. So even in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is walking through this cornfield. The disciples are hungry. They just take some corn, rub it in their hands. That's how they were provided for. And this is God's provision. It's perfect. So we're back in Ruth chapter 2. Give you a second to turn there. And in chapter 2, verse 3, it says, And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of a field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. So Boaz is a new kinsman to Ruth, uh, and also, of course, to Naomi, who was her husband's brother. Um, so, yeah, we also know that he's a man of God, and we can see that in the way that he speaks to and treats the strangers and his servants. Um, and one, th one thing we will see throughout the scriptures is the way God loves the fatherless, the widows, um, how much he hates when they're afflicted by mean men. And the same goes for anyone who's taking advantage of the weak and the downtrodden. So we read chap uh, James chapter 1 as our verse today. And that was for verses 26 and 27. Which says, If any man among you seem to be religious, bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Uh, we also have... Deuteronomy 27. It says, cursed, cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the strangers, fatherless, and widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. Sing, uh, Psalm 68 verse 4. It says, Sing unto God, sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. So God's judging them, but he's also judging how we treat them and what we do for them in their affliction. 
Uh, we'll turn to Psalm 94. Psalm 94. So I'll be reading through all of uh, Psalm 94, starting in verse 1. It says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth, render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things, and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger, and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, The Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Understand, ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when ye be wise. He that planted the, the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall he not correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall he not know? Shall not he know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity, until the pit be digged for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord hath been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. When I said, My foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. In the multitude of my thoughts, within me thy comforts delight my soul. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity, and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. So we saw here in verse 6, when it spoke about these people, it said they slay the widow, the stranger, and murder the fatherless. You know, God has no repentance for these people. You know, these people are destroying the most innocent. You know, when it comes to children, widows, fatherless, you know, these are people who need our help. And it's up to us, you know, to be able to help them when we see that need, you know, and not be like these wicked people who would not only just ignore them, um, but also actually slay them, kill these innocent people, you know. It's just wicked. Um, we'll turn to Isaiah chapter 10. We'll just read verses 1 to 4. Just says, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that write grievous, grievousness which they have prescribed, to turn aside the needy from judgment, and to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. What will ye do in the day of visitation, and in the desolation which shall come from far? To whom will ye flee for help, and where will ye leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down under the prisoners, and they shall fall under the slain. For all this is anger, and for all this my anger is, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So again, God's got judgment for these people. You know, he's looking like, you know, who's going to help them? Who's actually going to stand up for these people and help them? You know, and God despises those who would wickedly mistreat the fatherless and widows, the strangers and the poor. You know, and on the other hand, we do see a godly man, Boaz. You know, he's entreating the stranger, Ruth, who was a Moabitess. And she was also near kinsman by his brother. But because she chose to make the God of Israel her God and stood by Naomi and made God's people her people, then she found favor in Boaz's sight and also in the sight of the Lord. So we'll pick up in Ruth chapter 1. Sorry. I'll just read to you, Ruth 1.15 again, sorry, where it said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge, and thy people shall be my people, and thy, thy God my God. So if she hadn't made that important choice, 
then, you know, one, we wouldn't be talking about her today. And she also wouldn't be part of that kingly lineage, which we're going to get to in a little bit. So we're in Ruth chapter 2, and we're going to pick up in verse 4. I think we're reading through the rest of this, this chapter from verse 4. It says, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on, be on the field that they do reap, and go up, go thou after them. Have not I charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. And then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thy sight, in thy eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law, since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and art come up, come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favour in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip the morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah's, ephah of barley. And she shook it up, she took it up and went to the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She brought forth and gave it to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto his daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, That man is near of kin unto us, and one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabites said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men, till they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that, they'll meet the, they, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and at the end of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So there's a passage of time here we have as well. So yeah, we have a passage of time here. But he also went above and beyond and said, you know, to his men, not only let her glean from amongst the sheaves, but also if you have if you drop it on the ground, let her pick it up, don't rebuke her. Let her basically she was one of the family, just let her take whatever she needs. And that was it. You know, Boaz showed incredible kindness to her. You know. And you can see also that he had pure religion, you know, according to first James. You know, James chapter 1, you know, he showed true love and great works, you know, especially for those of the stranger and the widow. So again, we'll pick up in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? 
Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be, when he lieth down, thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in, and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. So Naomi's pointing out that Boaz is a near kindred, and she's saying the Ruth should seek him as a husband. Or at least, you know, maybe he knows the other kinsmen, as he happens to know, who would be able to redeem her land and redeem her uh, as a wife. So, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 25. We'll start in verse 5. It says, If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, uh, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of this city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stands to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot, and spit in his face, and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto the man that he will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that has his shoe loosed. I will turn to uh, Genesis chapter 38. Okay, so we got verse 6. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Onan, go unto thy brother's wife and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed would not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. So we see there in Deuteronomy that if brothers lived together and one died without children, then the brother was supposed to marry the wife, go in unto her and give them a child after the, the previous brother's name. If they were refused, they were shamed in front of the gate by the elders um, and sort of became a byword in the city. Um, but we also see here that Onan, you know, he took it a step further and disobeyed God and God slew him for that. Um, so it's just a bit of understanding of, you know, why you would seek after a kindred, why you'd seek after a brother, you know, or, or near of kin um, to marry. It's just, you know, this, was, this is what God commanded um, that they do. They marry within their tribe or within, you know, at least Israel. Um, so we'll pick up in Ruth 3, verse 5. It says, And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade, bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine, over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. So this just means she's like spread thy skirt. I know I've heard people say that this means fornication or it can mean any number of things, but we get it from Deuteronomy 27. It says, Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt, and all the people shall say amen. She's, Ruth is just asking him to do the, um, to perform 
um, you know, the duties of a husband under her. So just saying, you know, are you going to marry me? You know, because I need someone to marry me and take care of me. You know, and, and Boaz also praises her as well um, for not going after young men and strangers, which she could have done. She could have gone back home and just gone after young men and strangers, but, you know, she decided because these were, Elimelech's children were children of Judah, so, you know, she chose to come back to the tribe and marry within the tribe and come back to the kinsmen. So, and that was a blessing for her. That was a, a good thing that she did. So, she, you know, she's praised for that as well. So I'll read uh, following on the rest of this chapter. It says, And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. I mean, wow, what a thing to have said about you. You know, that you're a virtuous woman and to have the whole city know that you're a virtuous woman because you came back and wanted to marry, you know, within your, marry your kinsmen. It says, and now that is true that I am thy near kinsman. However, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, will let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. And she laid his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. And he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her. And she went to the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest till he have finished the thing this day. So Boaz, being a near kinsman, he was willing to raise up seed for the deceased kindred. You know, he was willing to fulfill those duties and marry Ruth um, to redeem her. Um, but there's one closer in kinship who was before Boaz in line to actually redeem any land of inheritance. So we pick up in chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here, and they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants, and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know that this, there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. So this is the package that came along. You can't just have the land. You've got to have the land. And you've got to have Ruth as well as your wife. So I think the reason why this other kinsman had to refuse is because he's probably already married, has children of his own inheritance. So he didn't want to mar that by joining them together. So he allowed Boaz to purchase Ruth as his wife and, uh, and the property that came with it. And we see the conclusion of the stories coming up where they marry and they bear children. So he said, uh, verse 7, Now this was the manner in former time in Israel, concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was the testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. 
And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Marlon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Marlon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. So again, we see Boaz as a noble man, you know, doing what was required of him according to the law, but also, you know, just even morally, what would just be the right thing to do to take care of these people, to take care of Ruth and Naomi. So, and all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. And then they start pouring blessings upon them. It says, the Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. I mean, we can certainly see that lineage came true. You know, and uh, let thy house be of the house of Pharaohs, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughters-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. So again, we see here that the relationship which she did have with her daughters-in-law, you know, they're saying is, is more important than even having seven sons. You know, just the fact that they still had that love for each other and that Ruth and Naomi were very close. And there are a couple of things that we take away from this. The first, of course, is how you should treat widows and how God has provision for them. You know, and you can tell a lot about a person by how they treat these people. You know, if they're godly and religious and if they're men of God, men of faith, you know, then you would expect them to treat the poor and the fatherless and the widows, you know, you'd expect them to be treated well, you know, especially those who can't give you anything in return, you know. And also another point is this is the same man and woman that God chose to raise up the godly lineage of King David. You know, he's an important figure, no doubt. He reigned in Israel 40 years and his sons reigned after him. And the Lord Jesus Christ being the last and eternal king over Israel. So I'll finish up in, in Ruth, in verse 12. Sorry, not in verse 12. In verse 17. And the women, her neighbors, gave a name, saying, This is a son born to Naomi. And they did call his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Pharaohs. Pharaohs begat Hezron. Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Aminadab. And Aminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon. Salmon begat Boaz. Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. So I will turn to Matthew chapter 1. Of course, we've got the other uh, genealogy here. And we see this whole genealogy, um, the book of the genealogy, the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Judas begat Pharaohs and Zara of Tamar, and Pharaohs begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram. And Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nason, Nason begat Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon, of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begat Joram, and, and Joram begat Uzziah, and Uzziah begat Jotham, and Joatham begat Achaz. Achaz begat Ezekias. Ezekias begat Manassas. And Manassas begat Amon. And Amon begat Josias. 
And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And, they, and after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel. Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begat Abiad. And Abiad begat Eliakim. Eliakim begat Azor. Azor begat Sadok. Sadok begat Achim. Achim begat Eliud. And Eliud begat Eleazar. And Eleazar begat Mathan. Mathan begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So again, we see Boaz is included in here. Ruth is included in here, in this godly lineage. And again, I think it's for a reason. It's because of the characters of people they were. It's because they, were, they loved the Lord and they did good works. So what I want to take away from this is our choices matter, you know, no matter how insignificant they might appear. Ruth had a choice to return home after her husband died and her sister actually did so. And with a famine going on, that may sound like a sound decision. But she chose not to return to her old gods or to the people she knew, but she chose to go to a new people that she didn't know and to worship a god that, uh, that was the god of Israel. And, you know, if you choose the Lord, uh, the God of Israel as your God as well, then you'll be saved and you'll find favor in his sight and in the sight of others. And the other thing that we learn is how to treat other people, especially those that can't help themselves, those that can never repay us again. You know, these are the fatherless, the widows, the poor, and the strangers. Turn to Matthew uh, 25. We'll just start in verse 35. It says, For I was unhungered, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in? or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we the sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it to one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. I mean, this is important as well, that, you know, not just for these groups of people who are downtrodden and in need of help, but also when you show love to your brethren. You know, when they need help, uh, when you step up and you help them, you know, just see a need and, and try and help. You know, this is important because, you know, because God says when we're doing it to others, we're doing it to him. You know, and he sees that. And we see how he judges people who look the other way when they see a need and they refuse to meet it. And we'll just read quickly from Hebrews chapter 13, just to close up. Just verses 1 and 2. It says, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So just be careful when you're going about your daily life. Just you see these things, just keep them in mind, just to help others, just to always think about what others may need. You know, these are the kind of people that Ruth and Boaz were like, Naomi as well, you know. So we need to be more like them. So uh, do you mind praying for me, Brother Callum?